Hi, my name is Suki Pada. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. It's my pleasure to be with you here today to discuss lung neuroendocrine tumors, or lung nuts, for the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation. So what are the epidemiologic trends of lung neuroendocrine tumors? Well, what we know is that lung neuroendocrine tumors are the fastest rising neuroendocrine tumor in incidence, and also the top three of neuroendocrine tumors in terms of prevalence. So now let's learn the language. How are lung nets classified? So lung nets are classified based on the following features. First is, does it look like a lung nut? Does it have neuroendocrine morphology? Second is with regards to mitotic count uh, per surface area of two millimeters squared, which gives us an indication of how many cells are dividing or growing within the specimen. Then there is examination of the presence or absence of necrosis, meaning are there areas of tumor that have died within the specimen, indicating that the cancer is overgrowing the blood supply. Although KI-67 may be performed in a lung neuroendocrine tumor, it is not used to definitively classify them. So there's two main categories of lung neuroendocrine tumors. On the right, on, we have poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which include small cell lung cancer and also large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. On the left, we have well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, which will be the focus of this talk, examining both typical carcinoid tumor and atypical carcinoid tumor. So how do lung nets present? So 20 to 30% present peripherally, meaning outside of an airway. And in that setting, there are generally no associated symptoms and the tumor has been incidentally found when imaging has been performed for another reason. However, 60 to 70% have central tumors at presentation and these occur within the airway and often cause downstream airway collapse. And because of this, they cause symptoms such as cough, uh, shortness of breath, wheezing, recurrent pneumonia, and sometimes even coughing up blood, otherwise known as hemoptysis. A minority of patients will present with a functional syndrome, such as carcinoid syndrome, where the tumor is overproducing serotonin, or Cushing syndrome, where the tumor may be overproducing a hormone called ACTH. So what is a standard workup for a suspected lung neuroendocrine tumor? As you saw from the last slide, imaging is key, both CT imaging of the chest, but also ensuring that we're in imaging the liver with a multiphasic CT abdomen or MRI abdomen. After reviewing the imaging, we choose what would be the best place to biopsy to get the answer, but also safest for the patient. Next, there's a pathology review. And if we have a suspicion that this is a carcinoid tumor based on the biopsy specimen, there is an additional imaging study called somatostatin receptor imaging. And some images of that are on your right. And so we used to perform uh, Octrea scans, which used to light up neuroendocrine tumors. But you can see in this image, it's a very fuzzy sort of low resolution scan. So now there's somatostatin receptor PETs, uh, which are also useful for patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, we have an example of the 68 gallium dotatate PET showing the liver metastases much more clearly in the same patients. And if we have a suspicion of a functional syndrome, we will also do some additional blood and or urine workup to definitively diagnose. So how are lung nets treated? Like other neuroendocrine tumors, a multidisciplinary tumor board review at diagnosis is key. And this includes our surgeons, our nuclear medicine physicians, our pathologists, and our medical oncologists, among a variety of other specialists. So what about treatment of surgery for lung neuroendocrine tumors? What are the indications? So the indication for surgery is really if the disease is local and can be completely resected. And that includes not only the primary lung tumor, but any associated lymph nodes on the same side of that lung tumor. We also evaluate for surgical candidacy, meaning the functional status of the patient going to be able to tolerate the risk of surgery. 
Is the lung function good? Oftentimes specialized tests like pulmonary function tests are performed. And depending on a patient's history, even cardiac testing or testing of the heart is performed to ensure the heart is strong enough. Ideally, the surgery is performed by a board certified thoracic surgeon. And that's because they have extra specialization and of course, surgeries within the thorax. There's different surgical approaches for a lung neuron contumer from open to minimally invasive, even with a robot. There are different types of surgical resections. And it's also very important that the nodes are interrogated and dissected during the surgery because we don't want to miss any micrometastatic disease. What if lung nets are unresectable and are metastatic? Then what are the treatment options? So first, I'd like to note that active surveillance may be an option. And that means meeting with uh, the physician on uh, a routine basis and also performing imaging. What are the decision factors we use to start systemic therapy for a patient with a lung net? We look at the pace of the disease, how quickly is the disease moving? We look at the tumor burden, where is the tumor located? How much burden is there? Does a patient have any disease-related symptoms? And is there evidence of a functional syndrome like carcinoid syndrome where treatment is necessary? And of course, this is a shared decision with the patient. What are the treatment options and what do they target? First, a somatostatin receptor is a target, either with somatostatin analogs, either octreotide or lanreotide. A peptide receptor radian nuclide therapy or PRT is also an option. Lutetium-177 dotatate is uh, one of the approved options for GEP nets, but for patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors, we do have a clinical trial that just activated that I'll go through with you on the next slide. Another target is the mTOR pathway, which can be abnormal in patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors. And there's a therapy there called Everlimus. It's a pill therapy and in fact is the only FDA approved therapy for patients with lung net. And then there's other options, chemotherapy. There's a variety of chemotherapy options I've listed. And there's a question of other uh, utility of other targets such as anti-angiogenic therapy that targets abnormal tumor vasculature or immunotherapy, which uses the immune system to try to treat the tumor. And that may be beneficial in a subset of patients with this tumor type. So this is the trial design of uh, PRT. This is going to be the first prospective trial of PRT in patients with lung uh, neuroendocrine tumors. We have to be able to see the tumor on a dotatate uh, PET scan. And uh, the diagnosis, of course, has to be a uh, lung carcinoid tumor, either typical carcinoid or atypical carcinoid tumor. And patients in the study are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive the investigational agent, which is Lutathera or PRT, versus Everolimus, our standard of care control arm treatment. And of course, we want to examine the efficacy, how effective these two approaches are and how they compare against each other. We, um, when we were designing this trial, it was very important to us that patients were able to cross over to the investigational arm if they experienced progression on the Everlimus arm. So this study just activated the overall PI is Dr. Tom Hope at UCSF, and I am the uh, co-PI. So finally, I want to touch on an uh, entity called diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, or DIPNEC. There's two ways to diagnose this, either pathologically or clinically. So let's look at the uh, figure in the center. So this is a pathologic diagnosis. It's often a spectrum of disease, including neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia on the far left, which is sitting within the airways, uh, essentially neuroendocrine cell overgrowths. You often see tumorlets or these very small carcinoid tumors, less than five millimeters. And sometimes this condition is also associated with carcinoid tumors. So this is a pathological diagnosis of DIPNEC, but sometimes this is hard to diagnose. So there's also a clinical definition. And oftentimes patients will have symptoms for years, even decades related to airway obstruction, cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, often will carry a misdiagnosis of asthma. 
And there are also some classic imaging findings we look at uh, demonstrating small airway disease. And sometimes we can see bilateral lung nodules indicating these small tumorlets or even carcinoid tumors. So treatment is yet to be defined in this uh, condition, but we uh, have seen some improvement uh, with somatostatin analogs, not only from a Mayo Clinic study, but also from a Stanford study that was led by one of the fellows there, Dr. Thomas Sun. So because this is a evolving disease in terms of our knowledge and how we best treat and how we best manage, sometimes guidelines are very helpful resource for not only uh, the physicians, but also for our patients. So this is um, a particular guideline from the Commonwealth and North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, one of the most recent lung net uh, guidelines that's been published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology. So I'd really like to thank you for your time and I'm open to questions in the Q&A. Thank you again. Mm.